Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, we are so glad to be here this morning to talk with you. Apparently, somebody wanted to labor on this day, and so they called it that. Well, we could care less, can't we? Because they don't care about us. Ladies and gentlemen, the new program, what you have in front of us is the Declaration of the Microtrust. What we need you all to understand is those of you who are part of this new program, you're going to be incorporated into the Microtrust. Now, hold on now. And so for those of you who that was the first words to come out of your mouth, shut up. Literally, shut up because nobody asked you if you already had a trust. We don't care if you already have another trust. It doesn't matter if you already have another trust. You can have a billion other trusts. This is called a micro trust. You're incorporated into a primary trust. You will never, ever, ever see the primary trust. Why? Because it has nothing to do with you. You're incorporated into that trust. The law doesn't require you to know about the trust. What the law requires you to understand is that in the micro trust, you stand in the position as the micro trustee, technically the position of a grantor and the position of a beneficiary. And you make the choice if you wanna operate in both capacities at the same time. That's your choice. Now, let me explain so that some of you guys will get it, because without any antics, without any anything, the governments don't control trust law. Your states do not control trust law. Their thesis and treaties and other pieces of junk doesn't control trust law. They, man, did not create trust law. I know it's hard to understand. Trust law is universal. It is not United States and China and Russia and New Zealand. That's why if you go to the Cayman Islands, you'll see that their trusts are set up the same way. Trusts are set up in the United States. England didn't create the trust. Now, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, go back and look at Genesis, the first chapter, verse 26 through verse 28 that was the establishment of a trust literally the whole first chapter starting with verse 26 all the way through the third chapter ending with verse 24 lets you know about the trust and the parties to a trust, and the parameters respecting the trust, and who the grantor were, and what were the penalties, and what were the markers. Now, the particular trust is what's known as a religious trust. A religious trust? I don't believe in no God. <laughs> oh, God, I love ignorant people. Ladies and gentlemen, religion does not mean God. It never did. Go and look up the definition for religion. Then go look up the legal definition for religion. And you will find that there is no consensus. Why? Because it's never been defined. Don't take my word for it. Just go do it. There is no definition for religion. It's based on beliefs. That's religion. Based on beliefs. Let me say it again. That's religion. Religion is based on beliefs. It has nothing to do with a belief in the God. Like I, I tell people all the time, R. Kelly believed he could fly. And now he's caught in a cage. All right? Sorry, R. Kelly. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I thought you said there was going to be no antics. That's not an antic. That's analytical. Ladies and gentlemen, your beliefs are yours. The Constitution makes it quite clear that is your freedom. You have the right 
that is secured by the Bill of Rights to your beliefs. Nobody can question your beliefs. I will tell you, there was a case, I believe it was the state of Texas, where a guy represented himself pro se, and he called Jesus to the stand. I kid you not. And the courts allowed it. Now, of course, they did it to make him look stupid. What? You guys didn't know? From the court's vantage point, Jesus was dead. It's actual proof that he died. Witnesses and everything. So how are you going to call him to the stand? Oh, no, no, no. You can't call a witness to the stand as a spirit creature. Well, Jesus lives. That's got nothing to do with it. From the court standpoint, he was dead. You cannot call a dead man to the stand. Dead men tell no tales. He is no longer human, so you cannot call a spirit to testify. He's not competent to testify as a spirit according to their law. I know, I know, you want to deal with semantics and you want to deal with arguing with me, but please, don't argue with me. Argue with the idiots who created these little stupid, ignorant laws that we all go by. What I'm trying to say in a nutshell, whatever your beliefs are, are yours. It has nothing to do with whether or not you believe in a God, because you probably also believe in a bunch of other things. Well, the law in the United States protects you within those beliefs. There is a trust known as a 508 trust. When you understand what a 508 trust is, you will recognize not only is it tax exempt. Now, look, I don't want you guys just to be tax exempt. Lord have mercy, I don't want you to be just tax exempt. Pay, 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 pay attention. I don't want you to be tax exempt. Your trust will be exempt, not just on taxes, but it will be exempt. So how do you handle that? Well, the trust is still allowed to make monies. It's still allowed to earn revenue. The only thing you can't do is have a profit at the end of the year. So if you operate under the trust and you continue to operate under the trust, ladies and gentlemen, all you got to do is pay yourself a salary, a reasonable salary, so where your trust will never, ever, ever, ever make a profit. If you guys do not understand, we're in a debt-based society. You are not supposed to be making a profit. Do you guys understand that? Profits are made in the Bible. They're not made in our economic society. We're in bankruptcy. You can't make a profit while in bankruptcy. Don't you all understand this? So it's okay. You want to pay taxes. Why? Because you write off everything. That's why you see write-offs are everywhere in taxes. Companies do write-offs all the time. But you have to do it the right way. This trust, it's not our job to explain these things to you. It's our job to give you the tools. It's your job to do the research. This micro trust will be at least 14 pages to 17 pages long. You will receive it only after we notarize it and affix the signature of the representative trustee for the primary trust. Once that happens, you'll receive the certified document with the certified seal on it, and you will then take it to your notary and get it notarized, and then you will send us a copy of the notarized document after you scan it into the computer. And those of you, you're going to receive instructions. Do not scan something with your cell phone. Do not do that because we'll reject it and send it back to you. You will scan it through an actual document OCR scanner. That means you're going to have to go to Kinko's or you're going to have to go to that other Staples or Office Depot or uh, what is it? What's the other Depot? You have Office Depot, oh, and then you have Office Max. So, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to go to one of those, or 
even UPS, but here's the UPS store. Here's the problem. You're going to end up paying almost $15 for that. So why not just go to a thrift store and pay $15 for a printer and then buy the replaceable ink from Amazon? And now you'll have a printer that you get to use permanently. Just an idea, but those of you who are used to scanning things with your cell phone, that won't work in this instance. This is a legal document. Again, this is a legal document. You don't take photos and send it as a legal document. So no, you will scan it into the computer um, and send it via PDF format. Just that simple. You won't add or change anything because if you alter a document that's been notarized and you'll be receiving a notarized document, then the document is void. And then you have just solidified the contract between the parties. You must understand, you're not concerned about the wording of this. This document gives you total control of your property. We don't have control over your property. That's the whole idea. We don't want control over your property. We're the grantor. The corporation is the grantor. We can set the parameters. We don't want control of your property. We're letting you keep control of your property, keeping control of your interests. We're creating the trust that specifies this. Why? Because why would we want control of your property? What what we need your property for? Look, many of you don't understand the the, the position, so let me explain. There is nothing new under the sun. Solomon was the wisest man, with the exception of Christ Jesus, that ever existed on this planet. Ever. When Solomon said there was nothing new under the sun, he could not have made a more profound statement ever. Everything that exists came from something that existed prior. Go talk to any scientist. They'll tell you. We are all from cells of those who have died before us, whether it was plant or animal or other biological agents, we exist as a result of their decay and they're no longer existing. Goes into the ground and it's recycled. The earth is a recycling machine. It's a perpetual recycling machine. Everything gets recycled on the earth. So there's nothing new. It's all used junk. If you don't believe me, show me a new car. I dare you. I dare you to show me a new car. See, new means that it didn't exist before. You can't do that. So we don't want your junk. Why would we want something that's used? Okay, that's your choice. We're not materialistic to the point we need more junk. I have enough junk, okay? So the premise is you keep control over your property. The microtrust, we're not going to show you the whole document. Oh, God, no. We'll show you the title. Hold on. We'll show you the title. Okay? See? The private participants to this contract create a private trust of the Eon Foundation, Fourth Amendment, securing one's property, irrevocable micro trust. Now, let's go over the Fourth Amendment, and then we're going to let you guys get back to your day. Fourth Amendment says the right of the people to be secure in their person. So the people have a right to be secure. Now, pay attention. Houses and papers and effects. Then it says against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, it's not just against unreasonable searches and seizures. This is not the subject matter. This is the right of the people to be secure. That's the subject matter. Pay attention. It says it shall not be violated. Well, what shall not be violated? The people's right to be secure. Why? It says, and no warrant shall be issued, but upon probable cause. Well, ladies and gentlemen, most people don't understand that probable cause requires a hearing. Probable cause, it's not... Oh, I think I got probable cause. It's not a matter of thought. Probable cause is a hearing. And they have a hearing every single time. 
whenever they get a warrant, they always have a hearing. A judge does not issue a warrant just because a judge feels like it because they can't. The law prohibits a judge, this law prohibits a judge from issuing a warrant without testimony, without a complaint, without a petition. Ladies and gentlemen, the only problem is they hold this hearing without you. That's illegal. That's called an ex parte hearing. It's illegal. They only permit it. Why do they permit it? Because they used to claim they didn't know where you were. They couldn't find you. But not anymore. They can't use that as an excuse now. They cannot use that as an excuse because they have your address. They have the driver's license. They have the state ID. They have your address. So by law, before they can have a hearing, it is a fundamental principle of due process that a party be given a right to appear, acquiesce, protest, or forfeit. But they must be given a right to attend the hearing. The court cannot hear, have the hearing without you. But that would change the whole system. That was slavery. It ain't my fault. Go back and change the amendment. It says, but upon probable cause. So probable cause cannot be had without a hearing. And if it's a hearing involving you, you have a right to be there. They cannot not give you the opportunity to be present. That's what they do every single time. And it's illegal. Pay attention, supported by oath and affirmation. This shows you that in order for there to be probable cause, there must be a hearing because it's got to be supported by oath. Somebody has to be under oath or affirmation. There has to be an affidavit then it has to describe what's going on. Testimony. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a hearing. All of these people getting arrested and going to jail and waiting for what's called an arraignment. No, the law does, you, do you see anything about an arraignment in here? It doesn't say nothing about arraignment. It says the warrant shall not issue but upon probable cause supported by oath and affirmation. So they can't even get a warrant for your arrest. The police officer cannot find probable cause unless he actually observed a crime. This is not something you argue with the police officer. This is something you argue at arraignment. And then you keep arguing all the way to the top. Why? Because eventually it stops. See, nobody's done it before. Every time I do it, Cases get dropped. And then they block every access to everything else because they figured they just satisfied me with dropping things. Ladies and gentlemen, they cannot have this hearing. This is a hearing. Probable cause it needs an oath, an affidavit, and they need testimony describing what things are the issue. Again, illegal. They cannot do it without a probable cause hearing. Now, don't get me wrong. Go ahead and ask the judge. Ask an attorney. Well, well, technically, but uh, they'll start doing all of that junk. They won't tell you, no, they don't need a hearing. Really? So you mean a judge can meet with the prosecutor and can meet with a detective and can meet with a supposed witness without a party being present? Interesting. Give me a second. Let me show you all something. Okay. Here is one case. And we, you don't have to worry about the case. Here's the phrase you need to know. The right to be heard ensures by the guarantee of due process, or insured by the guarantee of due process, has little reality or worth unless one is informed that a matter is pending probable cause hearing and can choose for him or herself whether to appear, default, acquiesce, or contest. See, you have a right to challenge. You have a right to be present. And that's why they quote this, because this is a fundamental due process right. And just in case you want to know, this is a class action lawsuit. This is the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, remember, this is not the United States Supreme Court. This is Supreme Court of the United States. The reason why it's that way, pay attention so that you understand. It's because this deals with a constitutional issue. So they must be in their constitutional, pay attention, capacity. Don't take my word for it. Go back and look at all the cases.
All right, the other one is an administrative court, the United States Supreme Court. So hold on. That, and then we're gonna put it right here. I don't know why I did that. I didn't want it to do that. Let's put that back. All right, there we go. Let's do the same thing there. We're gonna make it into a real a real document as opposed to this doing it the way it wanted to do it because we don't play that. Come on and do it. Do it. Do it till you're satisfied. Whatever it is. All right. Here's one case. The right to be heard has little reality or worth unless one is informed that the matter is pending and can choose for him or herself whether appear, default, contest. Okay? But we're looking for... What's the name of that stupid case? Uh, the right to be heard has little reality or worth unless one is informed that the matter is pending and can choose for himself whether to appear, acquiesce, contest, and so on and so forth. Y'all need to pay attention. So let me explain to you what this means regarding the Fourth Amendment. Not no stupid 14th Amendment. Ain't nobody want no privileges. I don't want your privileges. I have rights. I don't want no so-called your immunities. I don't want your rights. Don't read me what my rights are. I know what my rights are. Okay. Uh... This is what I want. Wake up. Principal. Stop listening. This is the case I'm looking for. Stop listening. Blaine versus Central Handover Bank Trust Company. This is the one I'm looking for because this was a case that started out of California and went all the way to the Supreme Court. This has not changed, ladies and gentlemen. This was in the 1960s that this case was heard. Oh, 1950s, okay? And i gone over this case. Uh, I got it from, I think it was, I, I believe it was from the original place I got it from was Freedom School, Freedom hyphen School. Anyway, United States Supreme Court. Now we're gonna do our search and control F. Let's get rid of that because that's getting on my nerves. So acquiescence, hey, it's here. It found it for me. Let's do that. Now, the right to be heard has little reality or worth unless one is informed that a matter is pending can choose for him or herself whether to appear, default, acquiesce, or contest. Appear is the one I always forget, okay? It's a fundamental requisite, meaning prerequisite. It's requirement of due process of law is the opportunity to be heard. It's not an opportunity after the fact. It's an opportunity before the fact, especially if there is testimony. Especially if there is testimony. We got one more thing that we need to show y'all. Sorry, I am a little distracted because I'm working on another computer on the other side uh, next to me. Two computers at the same time. How do you do it? I don't know. Okay, that's one acquiescence. And give me a second. You got the name of the case. You got the, the phrase and term. And we'll be right back. Can you explain what is an ex parte hearing? Wake up. Can you explain what is an ex parte hearing, comma, and how that ex parte hearings are illegal in criminal matters? Stop listening.
An ex part hearing is a legal proceeding in which only one party is present. This is in contrast to a regular hearing, in which both parties are present and have the opportunity to present evidence and be heard. Ex part hearings are sometimes necessary in emergency situations, such as when a party needs to obtain a restraining order or other type of urgent relief. In criminal matters, ex part hearings are generally illegal. This is because the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees the right to due process, which includes the right to be heard before adverse action is taken against you. Allowing ex part hearings in criminal matters would violate this right, because the defendant would not have the opportunity to present their side of the story. There are some limited exceptions to the... Hold on now. Pay attention. There are some limited exceptions to the rule against... Ex no, no, there's no rule. There's a law against ex parte hearing. It says, for example, a judge may allow an ex parte hearing if a defendant is in custody and is unable to be present. That's a lie. If the hearing is to address a matter of national security, again, a lie. However, these exceptions are narrowly construed and must be justified by a compelling need. Sorry, so why do they do it all the time? Ex parte hearings are illegal, ladies and gentlemen. You have a right to be present to hear any testimony against you. That's why he mentions the Fifth Amendment. So when a judge has some idiot before him saying that you did something or didn't do something and you're not present, then that gets thrown out. They cannot use that. They cannot try you. They cannot convict you. All of those people sitting in jail because they did not challenge this process in the first instance are still sitting in jail. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here to advocate violence. I'm not here to advocate crime. I'm not here to advocate murder. I'm not here to advocate for anyone who does something in violation of the law. But two wrongs don't make a right. So they cannot violate your rights to put you in jail. I don't care what you did. I don't care if you killed my own mama. I, I promise you. I promise you. I don't care. Because if they violate the law and call that justice, then there'll be no justice for nobody. So all of you need to be doing your habeas corpuses in the court for those people who are in jail, whom they got a warrant for them. They knew where they were because they went to the house that they were in and they arrested them. Ladies and gentlemen, that means they knew where they were. And if they knew where they were, that means that there was no need for an ex parte hearing. They, there was no justification. That means that they were supposed to give you an opportunity of being present. If you don't believe me, look at what they did to Donald Trump. Go ahead. Now, I'm not talking about when they searched his home because he consented to the search. When he became president, he consented to that search. Don't tell nobody. But when they were getting ready to hold the grand uh, jury hearings, they gave him notice. When they were getting ready to arrest him, they gave him notice. That's how it's supposed to be. So how come no one else gets notice? Uh-huh. What? Say so what? Exactly. I rest my case. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're putting together the trust to protect people's interests. We're not putting together the trust. Sorry. That's the... We're... Oh, sorry. I do have to talk about that document that I just showed. That is an EAN number for a deceit in a state. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not going to get that for our clients. Our clients are going to get that for themselves. We're going to give them instructions. Many of them are not going to be able to do it because they're not going to understand it. That's not our fault. Okay? For us to do it, they will have to pay the staff to do it. That's in addition. We said we were going to help them get a deceit in the state. We are going to do that. We're going to provide you the instructions. Many of you are either not going to want to do it or you're not gonna be able to understand how to do it, no matter how we explain it to you. So, your all caps name is not a legal, oh, excuse me, a lawful person, it's a legal person. You must understand the difference between lawful and legal. One is constitutional, 
One is statutorial. Your all caps name is a creature of statute. If you don't understand it, I can't explain it to you. It's not my job. But because it's a creature of statute and not a natural person, it's dead. It's not alive. But yet, it's being treated as if it's alive. You need to get control over that. You need to control that because that's yours. And so by getting authority over that estate, over that decedent, now you control it. They don't control it. You control it because now you have documentary proof that you control it. So when you're giving somebody that all caps name identification, you can now prove that, sorry, that is not me. I control that. That is my property. That property is protected under trust. Some of you are going to understand. Some of you are not going to understand. But again, I want you all to hear me. It's not our job to make you understand. You understand? Okay, I'm so glad we got that taken care of. So, ladies and gentlemen, sorry that this took 30 minutes, but it was necessary for you to ex for us to explain how the contract itself, the microtrust, hold on, how the microtrust is being structured. And this explanation here of shall not be violated, what it's referring to. Because wouldn't it be unreasonable for somebody to search your home without a warrant? That would be unreasonable, huh? Shouldn't they have a reason to search your home? Well, if they have a reason, don't you have a right to know? And pay attention. If Pay attention, y'all, because some of y'all ain't paying attention. If they go to a judge and get a hearing, don't you have a right to know what they're talking about? They, they can't have no secret hearings about you. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody can have secrets about you. Who can have a secret about you? No one. The government can't keep secrets about you. That's your papers, effects, person. You have a right to be secure. They don't have a right to have secrets about you. There is nothing in law that gives them the right to have secrets about you. So why are they having secret hearings? Because that's what an ex parte hearing is. They use the, firm, the phrase ex parte, but it means in secret. Because you, the person, the subject of the conversation, the suspect, are not privileged to the information of what's being discussed. You don't know if due process is being carried out there. You don't have, well, you do have a right to challenge, but they don't give you any notification that you had a right to challenge that hearing. No attorney challenges that hearing. This is a common practice in this country because people don't pay attention to the law. The law is the Bill of Rights. It is not those other amendments. The people did not ratify the other amendments. They ratified the Bill of Rights. So the right to vote, <laughs> you don't have to get somebody's permission to vote. You already had that right. It's part of the Bill of Rights. The people choose government, not Congress. Well, we needed a, a structure, a system. Yeah, and the people were supposed to tell Congress, this is what you're to elect. Well, they did that. No. Go ahead and look up the, the Voting Rights Act. Congress did that on their own. All that junk they did before was illegal when they said blacks couldn't vote and they needed to have an IQ test uh, in, in order for them to be able to try to vote. And, 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 and. exactly. Y'all need to understand what's really going on in our society. They are playing games with people's lives. They're playing games with people's property because you guys don't understand the language. They're taking advantage of you. I just used the word ex parte, and many of you probably have never even heard the word ex parte. It's ex party. The party's not included. They're excluded. Exclusion of party. Ex parte. It's illegal. Why? But upon probable cause, support it. 
by oath and affirmation. Ladies and gentlemen, probable cause does not happen without there being an oath, I swear that the truth and blah, 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 or affidavit, which you have a right to rebut, and particularly describing the place searched, to be searched, see, to be searched in the future, and the persons, legal and or fictional, or things, your things, your effects, to be seized. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a right to contest that, not after the fact, not after they've come and done it, because it's unreasonable if they are violating your rights for you to have to fight it at the end. I thought innocent until proven. So if there is no proof of guilt, then they don't have a right. And if there is no proof presented to you that you get the challenge according to the Fifth Amendment, no one can be held. That includes your property. Pay attention. You have the right to be securing your person's property. And if they take these things, that's like taking something from you and holding you as well. No one may be held to answer for any crime unless upon probable cause or due process of law. Probable cause is due process of law. This is the law. This is the letter of the law, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what they're ignoring. It is my hope that some of you will understand this. Some of you, some of y'all ain't gonna understand it because y'all y'all just, man, that was over my head. Yeah, I'm only five foot three. Okay, so to get it to where you understand it, the new program has several different aspects. As always, anything I do, I am not just going to give you one, two, or three things. But last night, I was given a lot of thought. Even this trusting is a whole lot more valuable. The people who came in at $300, it's a whole lot more valuable. And so we're not going to keep the 660 price up there for too long because of the different aspects and things that are in this. Okay, so again... You're going to be receiving communications very shortly, letting you know about the automobile aspect of things. This is only one aspect. There's a section for you to enter all of your property. All of your property. When we give you the thing about the deceit in the state, you do the same thing for your children. They're deceit in the states. You do the same thing for your mother, your mother, your sister, your father, your brother, your uncle, cousin, niece, your nephew. You do it for everybody. Yeah, some of y'all got two mothers. All right. Anyway. You do it for everybody. The seed in the state. That's only part of it. Well, can we do a microtrust? No, you can't incorporate them in our microtrust. Well, can we do our own microtrust? Well, you can do your own microtrust, but you don't have any understanding of the structure of the actual primary trust, how it's structured and how it's designed. I told you, I created this. Hold on. Give me a second. I'm going to show you something else. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is part of your microtrust. I want you to pay attention. A passage statement. This thing didn't exist until yesterday because I created it. Now, I want y'all to pay attention to the passage statement. We're going to let it read it for y'all. Hold on now. A passive statement as a passage causality clause, summarizing, categorizing, clarifying, solidifying, as well as documenting the intent, wishes, and nature of the presentment. A fact cannot be altered. A fact cannot be amended. A fact cannot be changed. A fact cannot be rebutted. The aforementioned are universal truths respecting what is and is not rebuttable. Any and all facts stated within this presentment are the intent of the grantor. In the grantor's intentions respecting this specific trust is the law respecting the parties associated with this trust. The trust is only reviewable by arbitration according to the dictates outlined within the original trust document, the primary trust instrument. The trust is written contextually and may only be construed contextually any attempt by any party whether directly or indirectly associated with this trust, to alter and slash or change the intent of the grantor and slash or the obligations of the parties is spelled out in the trust shall constitute a breach of the agreement between the parties subjecting the Brea to liabilities, consequences, fault, and other penalties associated and delineated in the primary trust agreement associated with this. Microtrust instrument. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, there I gotta finish proofreading because like I said, I just made the up last night. Um give me one second so that I can explain something. A G E and not that N. There's another N. Where you at, N? Oh, that's the N. A N D. 
and the grantor's intentions. Ladies and gentlemen, so that you understand something, what was being said right there is a fundamental principle of law. You cannot rebut a fact. See, there's a group called the Spinners, and they're saying it takes a fool to learn. And Mr. Felipe um, of the Spinners, the lead singer, he said, you can't color a thought, and you sure can't touch an emotion. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, he was stating facts. You can't color a thought. Man, that's a colorful thought. You can't color a thought. And you, man, I was touched by that. <laughs> I mean, you touched me in my soul. You can't touch an emotion. Those are facts. Ladies and gentlemen, what you must understand is a fact. And I, I want to pause y'all for a second. The fact is that the Fourth Amendment makes it quite clear that the right of the people, it's a right, it's not a privilege. You don't have to ask permission to be securing your person. Pay attention, it says the people. The people means a common community, means a group. So not only do you have as a group the right to be secure, but you also have the individual right to be secure. Now, pay attention, in your home, in your papers. So when you're out in public, you are, if you're minding your own business, then that means you're not in public. So the first thing, let me explain this to you so you guys understand. When you see the police and they walk up to your vehicle and they have their video recorder and their audio recorder, you say, excuse me, are you recording me at this time? Is your video camera on? And if they say, Video or audio? Yes, I'm recording video and audio. I'm sorry, I do not wish to be recorded. You do not have my permission to record me. Well, you're out in public. Excuse me, I am not out in public. This is my private conveyance. And if you think I'm outside of my property for which I have the right to be secure inside of, then you're out of your mind. So no, you do not have my permission. And you are hereby ordered to cease and desist. Don't argue with them. Don't argue with them. Because anything that happens after that, and if he continues to record, the case goes out the door. You don't have to argue with them. Just go ahead and go through with the motions. Doesn't matter what happens after that, you win. Ladies and gentlemen, they have a right to record in public. Like these uh, First Amendment auditors who are going inside businesses and recording other people. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not in public. When you're in a private building, you're not in public, but they say we're in a public building. A public building? No such thing. There's no publicly owned buildings in America. All these properties are owned by private corporations. Shh, don't tell nobody. See, y'all don't really want to get technical with the idiots because the idiots will get technical back. There's no need to get technical. But when you're out in your private conveyance, when you, now pay attention, I want you to understand, you're on a commercial airline then you are in public. Why? Because it is a commercial airline. That's not private property. As long as they uh, panter to the public, then they can't kick you out unless you've committed a crime. Commercial airlines is not a private airline. Pay attention to the word, commercial. They are public. They are open to the public. It's not a private facility. Now, they do have areas that are restricted to private individuals, such as ticketed passengers. They have contracts with those individuals. But entering into the airport, that's a public arena, a public space. Y'all need to understand that. So when you go to an airport parking lot, there are so many technicalities here. Again, we're not here to tell people how to get around so much of the stupidity on this planet. We're telling you that most people don't understand the Fourth Amendment and what it does. You see, it says against unreasonable searches and seizures. It says it shall not be violated. They cannot violate it even under a technicality. Shall not is a mandatory thing. It doesn't say unless 
but it says, but upon probable cause. That is the only way they can interfere with that right is with probable cause supported by a hearing where someone testifies via oath or affirmation because that's what an oath is, testimony. Go ahead and look at the Fifth Amendment. Remember, the Fourth Amendment leads to the Fifth and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized with particularity. So it has to be specific, cannot be generalized. Well, Your Honor, we have um, information that the person fitting his description, fitting the description. No, you need more than just a fit. <laughs> you need a perfect fit. It cannot be general. It says, particularly describing with particulars, not generalities. Again, once you understand the basics of the Constitution and you understand the basics of the 613 laws of the Torah and how they were put together and why they were put together, then you can understand what these idiots are doing in these courts. So, got to go, ladies and gentlemen. I've spent too much time explaining all of this to you, but we wanted to give you guys an education as to what's going on with the new program. All right? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your time. Have a very good day.